This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. I'd like to welcome you all to the monthly meeting sponsored by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Thank you all for coming. The Vegetarian Society is a not-for-profit volunteer organization founded in 1990 for the purpose of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education. Tonight's lecture, as usual, is being videotaped for broadcast on the VSH weekly TV series, Vegetarian. On Oahu, the program airs on Thursdays at 6 p.m. on Olelo, channel 52. We recommend that you tape each show. Keep the ones you like. Tape over the ones that you don't feel you want to watch again. If you go to the Vegetarian Society website, and that's vsh.org, and click on video, you will have access to 75 of our previous programs. So we are slowly entering the, uh, the real world, the 21st century, and eventually all of ours will be put online. So we're very pleased at this new development because now obviously people all over the world can see these shows. It's now time for our special guest. We're happy to have with us tonight Dr. Steve Blake. Dr. Blake has authored over a dozen major publications, including the book Healing Medicine. He also created The Diet Doctor, computer software for evaluating and graphing the nutrients in diets. He lectures nationally and internationally on how to stay healthy and has taught anatomy, physiology, and exercise physiology. He holds doctorate degrees in naturopathic medicine and holistic health. His topic tonight is Vitamins and Minerals Demystified. Please welcome Dr. Steve Blake. <laughs> well, good evening. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Alita, for the nice intro. For the last year, I've been working very hard on a textbook on vitamins and minerals. McGraw-Hill now has it at the printers, and it'll be out September 21st. It was a Herculean effort to go through all of these vitamins and minerals and try and make sense out of them. So I'm going to try and make sense out of them for you tonight. And principally, I'm going to be talking about the vitamins and minerals in healthy food rather than what you might at first think I would be talking about would be little pills. So vitamins and minerals, they can lower your risk of infection and cancer. There's a great deal of agreement that vitamins and certain minerals can reduce your risk of infection and cancer. I'm going to be talking quite a bit about how you can get the nutrients you need to burn fat. And of course, we all want to lower our risk of the major killer, heart disease. Some vitamins are helpful with that too. So here's the primer on human nutrition, as simple as it gets. Carbohydrates, fats, and protein are able to supply energy to our bodies. And they are burned with the help of enzymes that rely on vitamins and minerals. And we need water and air. And that's about it. That's human nutrition in a nutshell. So here are the vitamins. They're is some confusion over what a vitamin is. Now, a vitamin is defined as something that is essential for life. You just can't live without it. You get a terrible deficiency disease and die. And also, a vitamin cannot be made inside the body. Now, the vitamins that you see on this list behind me is made by the Food and Nutrition Board of the Institute of Medicine. And the list could perhaps be a little bit better. There are a few vitamins in there that aren't, strictly speaking, vitamins. Vitamin D, for instance, is not a vitamin for probably anyone in this room. Vitamin D is only a vitamin for people who don't get 
even a tiny bit of sunlight on their bodies throughout long periods of time. So vitamin D, well, is a, it's a vitamin for a child who works 14 hours throughout all the daylight hours in England at the turn of the century, and that's how rickets was discovered, and so they called it a vitamin. It's a very unusual vitamin, too. It's a, more like a hormone. But there they all are, the B vitamins as a group. Vitamin C is the most taken vitamin of any of the supplementary vitamins. An amazing number of people seem to think it's good for them and take extra, more than they would get in food. Here are the minerals. Minerals are divided into the major minerals, also known as the macro minerals, and then the trace minerals. These major minerals, calcium, you'll see, is the one that we need the most of, and these represent the amount in the human body, in an average size human body. So you can see calcium, phosphorus, sulfur, and magnesium are the macro minerals. Three of them are electrolyte minerals. And we've all heard the Gatorade ads, and electrolytes are vitally important. The best way to get your electrolytes is from fresh fruit. That's really the best way to get your electrolytes. You've probably noticed that if you are working hard and it's, you're sweating a lot and you keep just drinking water, you start feeling deficient and you're deficient in these electrolyte minerals. Fascinating how the body works with these electrolytes and regulates your water balance using the electrolyte minerals. The trace minerals, you need much less of. This graph is really a thousand times bigger than the last one. In other words, this one's in milligrams and the last one was in grams. So you need a lot less of iron than you do calcium, but you need iron quite a lot. Iron, by the way, is the world's leading deficient nutrient. About one billion people worldwide are deficient in iron. And iron deficiency, especially during pregnancy, has very bad consequences. So, best sources of iron? Green leafy, dark green leafy vegetables is my favorite source of iron. One of the best and easiest to assimilate sources of iron. I'm going to have lots of charts so you can see where these nutrients come from. And just to rest your eyes for a moment, this is Flat Rock Pool. My wife and I live on Maui, and we have an organic farm where we grow lots of organic food, especially avocados and uh, fruits and vegetables, corn and beans and such. And this, this pool is near our home. I want to talk a little bit about vitamin C. You'll see two images there, competing images. The top one is the vitamin C crystal, which is quite an attractive looking crystal. And the bottom one is a cold virus, which is kind of a mean-looking sphere with little nodules on it, just designed to grab a hold of you. Now, I think the best way to avoid colds is to avoid eating dairy products and eggs. And that seems to be the most powerful way that a person can not get colds. I, by the way, have been a vegetarian for 37 years, by far not the longest in the vegetarian society, and I've been vegan most of that time. I wonder about the crowd here. Do we have any vegans in the crowd? Oh, well, that's uh, quite a few. How about vegetarians? Oh, quite a few more. Okay, well, that sounds like you've all been thinking about diet and working your diet, and I, I sure do encourage you all to continually improve not only your diet, but your exercise and fitness and your stress levels, keep mellowing out and getting more relaxed. So, back to vitamin C. They found that more vitamin C is needed during colds. And one of the reasons that vitamin C is helpful with colds is it has an antihistamine effect. This helps with the swelling such as in your sinuses and in your nose that is typical of colds, this, this swelling part. So vitamin C can help a little bit with the antihistamine effect. Now, there are two components of the immune system called phagocytes and leukocytes and they need to be charged with vitamin C to be effective. There's another aspect, is when our immune system is attacking cold viruses or many other pathogens, our immune system uses free radicals to perform its work. So it attacks these pathogens with free radicals. Well, the leftover free radicals need to be scavenged up by vitamin C so they don't damage our own tissues. So that's another way that vitamin C helps. Let's see, when was it? In the early 70s, I think, or was it the late 60s, Linus Pauling wrote a book called Vitamin C in the Common Cold. It created quite a stir, partially because Linus Pauling holds both a, a Nobel Prize in Chemistry and a Nobel Prize in Peace and is a widely respected man. 
His book was very controversial and it continues to be quite controversial today. Does vitamin C in pill form prevent colds? Probably not exactly. But vitamin C in fruits and vegetables certainly does. It shortens the duration of a cold a little bit and it helps with the symptoms moderately. So it, it does seem to help a little bit. Interferon's another thing that C it, now, one really important thing in the studies that used both C in foods and C in pills is that the colds didn't progress on to pneumonia when there was vitamin C available, and, and that by itself is pretty important. Now, as I wrote my textbook on vitamins and minerals, I produced charts like the one you see up here. And these charts have a list down the edge of the different food groups. And so you'll see grains, vegetables, fruits, proteins, and meats listed down the side. The bars indicate relatively how much of selected foods in each of these groups have. With vitamin C, we see that oranges have won the prize as being the top. But it's also very interesting to note that broccoli and green leafy vegetables, vegetables and fruits in general, are great sources of vitamin C. Also, it's interesting to note that the other foods don't give you any vitamin C at all. So there's simply none in meat products or dairy products and almost none at all in, in grains or beans. They're really restricted to the fruits and vegetables. Almost all other animals can synthesize vitamin C in their livers, but humans cannot. We're missing a certain enzyme that would enable us to do this. So we are dependent upon getting vitamin C from our diets. And the idea of breaking food into tiny little parts called vitamins and minerals is really not that great an idea because it confuses everybody. The simple thing is that if you're eating lots of fresh, whole, plant-based foods, you're getting all the nutrients you need, with the possible exception of B12. But all of the other nutrients are there in abundance, and so breaking it up, I don't know if we really need to do that too much. I want to talk about vitamin A now a little bit while we're on the subject of infections. Vitamin A has its biggest effect on mucous membranes and mucus secretion, and also on skin. So vitamin A helps the barrier, the protective barrier of our bodies. Your skin, by being flexible and impermeable, protects you against infection. And in the intestinal tract, the mucous membrane is an extremely important inner lining of our digestive tract and many other areas such as sinuses and lungs in the body. Intact mucous membranes in the sinus, for instance, are going to protect you from germs like bacteria and virus getting in there and, and attacking you. Blood cells such as lymphocytes, which are immune system components, do depend upon vitamin A and T lymphocytes are another component of our immune systems and they also need vitamin A. Zinc is essential also for T lymphocytes. So you've heard about zinc being helpful with infections. Well, that's why. A couple notes about vitamin A. First, I'll show you a food source of vitamin A. Now, did you know that the winner in vitamin A is spinach? I wonder if you all would have thought that. Well, vitamin A comes in two forms, beta carotene and in the preformed kind, which are typically retinal esters. The human form of storage in the liver is retinal palmitate. And I'm going to show you some of those forms in a minute. But once again, I want you to notice that the vegetables and the fruits have this incredibly important nutrient that helps us fight off infections, whereas the other types of foods don't. Now, here's some real fun stuff. The chart on your left, you'll see on the bottom, beta carotene. It's much longer than the preformed types of vitamin A. But what's really fun is that our bodies can cleave or break apart beta carotene into two pieces, each piece of which is a retinal, which is the form of vitamin A that can then be translated into the other forms of vitamin A. So there's some things to know about vitamin A. For instance, all of the forms of vitamin A found in animal products are not antioxidants. Only beta carotene is an antioxidant. And I think that's fascinating. Prior to writing this textbook, I really didn't make that clear to myself that humans really need the beta carotene form of vitamin A, which we can cleave in half to make all other forms of vitamin A. What about carnivore and omnivorous animals? They cannot cleave beta carotene apart into vitamin A. Well, the flip side of that is that to humans, the vitamin A found, for instance, in animal livers is potentially very toxic to us. But for animals that are carnivorous, 
or omnivores like bears and dogs, that form of vitamin A is not toxic to them. And this is a clue that humans are truly vegan animals, uh, just one of many clues. So you'll see that there are several different forms of vitamin A up there, and it's real interesting. Retinol is this transport form, and that's the one that help keeps your, helps to keep your skin healthy and intact and keep infections away. Retinol is the one that you've heard about for night vision. Retinol is used in the rod cells of the eyes for night vision and truly does improve your, your night vision. Retinoic acid is a fascinating and very complex form of vitamin A, and that helps with cell growth and differentiation. And that can help prevent cancer if you have adequate vitamin A stores. I guess I should mention that it's courtesy of McGraw-Hill that I'm using my own drawings here. Okay, I want to talk for a minute about older people. I'm a member of the baby boomer generation, and, and I know many of us here tonight are no longer spring chickens. So there are some considerations when people get older. There is a slightly higher risk of thiamine deficiency. Now, thiamine is vitamin B1. Thiamine was the first vitamin to be discovered, and it was discovered when rice was polished in Japan, and people got this very strange disease because they were not no longer getting th enough thiamine from their polished rice. Folate, uh, folate was named after the foliage, the green foliage, and that's its principal source. Folic acid is the form that's used in fortification or supplementation, and folate is the form found in food and in the human body. Many of you have probably not heard of folate as a term because you've heard of folic acid more commonly referred to. That's the supplement form. Now, blood homocysteine levels, you've probably heard from other lecturers and from your reading that homocysteine is a blood chemical that is a strongly correlated with heart attacks and strokes, something that's bad. And folate levels should be kept up as we get older. But what's the best way to do it? Green leafy vegetables. Vitamin D can be a problem for older people, probably not in Hawaii. But if older people are institutionalized, or in fact, if anyone is institutionalized and kept away from sunlight, then vitamin D can become a problem. And it is vitally important for people to have vitamin D. Of course, the healthy and natural way to get it is from sunlight. Older people do tend to be very cautious, and in fact, even younger people, what are we told? The sun is dangerous. It causes cancer. Stay away from it. Cover up. Wear sunscreen. Well, sunscreen dramatically reduces your vitamin D absorption. But interestingly enough, the active form of vitamin D fights cancer in the body very powerfully. And there's no question at all that vitamin D is needed to fight cancer. So no vitamin D at all is a very bad thing. Too much strong sunlight on the skin, of course, is also a bad thing. Sodium is something that Americans take way too much of. It's, it's found in food. I'm going to talk some more about that with regard to osteoporosis. But for older people, the levels are a little bit lower, and we should continually try and... There's plenty of sodium in natural foods, natural whole plant-based foods. And when I say whole plant-based foods, I'm talking about primarily fruits and vegetables, also beans, nuts and seeds, and grains. And by grains, the good ones, of course, are the whole grains not the processed grains. I'm going to talk more about that, too. Magnesium is a vital nutrient, and I think it's been ignored a little bit. Magnesium happens to be the central atom inside of chlorophyll, which is the green pigment in all your green leafy foods. So magnesium is really important, and again, it's found in green leafy foods. Zinc is my final thought for older people. You want to keep your zinc levels up. Nuts and seeds are generally good ways to get enough zinc. Zinc's commonly deficient in agricultural soils, so you need a bit of a diversity of different nuts and seeds to get enough zinc. Okay, now this is a real fun part of the talk for me. Okay, we all want to look like this young man here who's sprinting along, or at least feel like him. What about energy? What about fat? Well, some interesting things. These vitamins in particular I want to concentrate on tonight, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the body produces energy from the three nutrient foods. Remember, that's fats, carbohydrates, and protein can be burned in the energy in the body for energy. Now, carbohydrates are designed to be burned in the body for energy, and they're the easiest to burn for energy. 
Fats also can be burned for energy, whether they're taken out of storage from our fat cells or whether they're taken in from fatty foods. Protein is not really designed to be burned for energy, but our bodies don't really know what to do with extra protein, so they burn it for energy. There's no real storage outside of our needs. So, how do we lose weight? How do we keep fat off? How do we stay slim and energetic? Well, it turns out that there's a key here that has not been made clear in the popular press, and I haven't seen it in the journal articles or books either, is that it's not so much what you don't eat, it's what you don't get. So certain vitamins and minerals are necessary to burn fat, and I'm going to talk more and show you some figures that describe how these nutrients help you to burn fat. Now, it not only helps you burn fat, but it helps you to create energy, and energy is a good thing. We like that. This is a kind of a stylized drawing here, and this figure shows you a little bit about how fat and carbohydrates and protein are burned inside the body. So whether it's carbohydrates, fats, or protein, they all go to a central place. And for simplicity, I've called it pantothenic acid. It's really acetyl coenzyme A is what should be in that box, but I couldn't fit the words in, and it's a long word anyway. So I just put pantothenic acid because pantothenic acid makes up about half of coenzyme A. And pantothenic acid is a very interesting B vitamin. Now, once these carbohydrates or other nutrient sources have been processed here, they go into the TCA cycle. This TCA cycle used to be known as the Krebs cycle. This cycle is where the nutrients are stripped off of their electrons, which are sent down to the electron transport chain, and that electron transport chain then produces higher energy phosphates. They take adenosine monophosphate that has one phosphate group, pump it up to adenosine diphosphate, which has two phosphate groups, and then finally into adenosine triphosphate, which has three phosphate groups. That's the fully charged energy battery of the cell. That's what makes our minds think. That's what makes our muscles clench. That's what makes us able to breathe. All of the energy done in the body is performed with the energy from ATP. So that's how it works. In our, inside of our cells are little organelles called mitochondria, and these organelles take the nutrients, they take the vitamins and minerals and the enzymes, and they create charged ATP, and then that ATP is used throughout the body to create all of our energy. And I'm going to look a little bit at what can block that. For instance, we take vitamin B1, thiamine, and we see that without the assistance of vitamin B1, carbohydrates can't really be processed into this loop. So this is going to cause problems with energy production. So your nutrients aren't even getting to the TCA cycle. They're blocked right there. Thiamine is found in many different foods, and you'll see the winner this time is sunflower seeds. Seeds are an incredibly good source of nutrition. And unlike nuts, they're a little bit cheaper than nuts. They're uh, quite reasonable. Sunflower seeds, sesame seeds are some great seeds. Basically all seeds are excellent sources of nutrition. They're perhaps a little bit hard. You either need to chew them up a lot or blend them or, or somehow make them a little more accessible. But they're, they're real powerhouses of nutrition. And you also see that grains have a lot of thiamine. And this, of course, we're talking about whole grains. Now, enriched flour is the second bar down, and the top bar is whole wheat flour. And the reason why those bars are the same is that they, after stripping out the thiamine from the whole grains and making it into white flour, they add back a synthetic thiamine to the flour. So, in a sense, if you're eating white flour products, such as pasta or donuts or any of the millions of things made with white flour, crackers and cookies, you are, in fact, taking a, a supplement in a way. It's called fortification. And it's, it's mandatory in the U.S. that grains are fortified with certain nutrients. What about B2? Well, look at this. Without B2, you really can't process your fats. The fats can't get in there. Now, that's even more important for people who want to lose a little bit of extra fat from their body or be able to efficiently burn the fat in their food. Because once the fat, it, let's say you're digesting some fat and from any source, and it goes into your bloodstream, and the essential fatty acids go into the cell where it's, it's demanding a few to make some energy because carbohydrates are a bit low. Well, it can't get in there. It can't make energy aerobically without the assistance of vitamin B2. 
And where is vitamin B2 found? Luckily, it's found almost everywhere. All of the food groups are well represented, and the winner is spinach once again. Spinach, by the way, I have 21 graphs of nutrients, and spinach won either first place or second place in 15 of the 21. So it is, how can I say it? Popeye was right. So spinach, broccoli, chard, asparagus, and also almonds and soybeans are good sources of, of riboflavin. You'll see that it's also found in animal products, and these are not good sources because if you eat animal products, this increases your chances of heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and many other chronic diseases. Well, let's take a look at niacin. Now, niacin's a very interesting vitamin because we can make niacin in our bodies. So in a way, it defies the rule of a vitamin cannot be made in our bodies. Our bodies can take t excess tryptophan, which is one of the essential amino acids, a uh, component of protein, and we can make niacin from tryptophan. In fact, in many diets, we'll find that we get more niacin from the tryptophan than we do as niacin natively in the diet. Nevertheless, it's still qualified or classified as a vitamin, this, this niacin. And look at how essential that is. It's used in all phases of energy production. And this is probably why they kept it in as a vitamin. It's absolutely critical to burning fat, carbohydrates, and protein. It's critical to the TCA cycle, and the electron transport chain can't work without it either. So niacin is really an important one. Now, you'll see with niacin that the largest sources of it are in animal products but it also is well represented in grains. Niacin deficiencies aren't too common. It, if you eat enough food, and especially if it's whole plant food, you're going to get enough niacin. Niacin is also fortified in white flour products, so that niacin deficiencies don't exist very commonly in America at all. Pantothenic acid is a whole nother story. Pantothenic acid, as you see, is right in the, I call it the center of energy. Because without pantothenic acid, you really can't process any of your vital nutrients into energy. And pantothenic acid is a little bit different. Now, you can see here that pantothenic acid, sunflower seeds won again. So, so far, spinach and sunflower seeds are the clear winners of the night, nutritionally speaking. And it's good to know which are the most energy-dense foods. Pantothenic acid is, is pretty well represented in different foods, but if you eat a lot of white flour, you wind up not getting enough of it. And uh, I want to also mention vitamin B6 here. Vitamin B6 is used to convert different amino acids. It's called transamination. And, no, it's not a religious state. It's the conversion of one amino acid to another. It also helps to prepare glucose Glycogen is a storage form of glucose. It's the way it's stored in our bodies, and it breaks that apart, and then that's broken into pyruvic acid, and then that goes down into acetyl coenzyme A. But I'm going to try not to use any big words. Uh, vitamin B6, pyridoxine, since it's so involved with protein metabolism, I decided to call it the protein burner. And it's found, a lot of people get it in fortified cereal. But spinach is an excellent source of vitamin B6. So this is a mill that produces white flour. It doesn't look a lot like a giant factory. It loses the, the whole wheat berries, lose a lot of their vitamins and minerals when they're processed. And this has a big effect on Americans. Typically, the problem that Americans are suffering is that they are overweight and tired and yet somehow still hungry, somehow yet unsatisfied by the food they're eating. And that's because the food doesn't have the nutrients that it really needs. They do add back some synthetic vitamins to it. But with pantothenic acid, only 43% remain, and only 13% of the vitamin B6 remain. Vitamin B6 is not added back to it. So when you're eating white flour, you're not getting a good deal. And white flour is very pervasive. I challenge you to find a noodle of any kind without, that is not made from white flour. It is possible, but it's very difficult. And if you were to peruse the shelves of almost any grocery chain, looking for a bread that is truly whole grain, good luck. For instance, if the first ingredient says wheat flour, you might think, ha, I found it. This is a whole grain. But no, wheat flour is defined as white flour. And if you're in a health food store and you see a loaf of bread that says unbleached wheat flour, You'll think to yourself, I found it. This is a whole grain. No. It's white flour, but not bleached, but still stripped of all of these nutrients I'm talking about. So you have to be a little careful in your shopping. 
So even though 43% of the panathenic acid remains after milling, then once it's frozen or processed or canned, more of it goes away. So panathenic acid may be one of the limiting factors for people to make energy and get thin. So here's a little bit of a diagram that shows how pantothenic acid and vitamin B6 are how they limit the ability to produce energy. You basically, vitamin B6, you, you can see a little blow up of how the amino acids are shuffled around with vitamin B6 and fed into this energy producing part of our bodies. And you've got to have them and they're stripped out of white flour and that's my basic message there. Magnesium is another one that can limit energy production. Magnesium is needed to convert thiamine to its active enzyme form. Now, here's where the scientists missed it a little bit. Thiamine doesn't do anything in our bodies. It has to be converted to thiamine pyrophosphate, which is the enzyme form of thiamine, in order for us to burn energy. But it can't be converted in our bodies without magnesium, which is stripped out of white flour. Even though they add in the thiamine, it really doesn't do you much good. So it's almost as if the thiamine wasn't there at all, because its active form isn't there. And of course, what happens to carbohydrates that we eat that can't be burned for energy? Well, they go into storage, and the storage form is fat, and we all know where that goes. So 76% of magnesium is removed from wheat in the refining process. None is added. And about 70% of magnesium is removed from brown rice when you make white rice. So the great majority of that, magnesium is a critically important nutrient, I think that is limited. And your best way again to get it is to just to eat a whole plant-based diet. And that's where that weird whole comes in. Now you see some of the more importance when instead of just saying a plant-based diet, I say a whole plant-based diet. Because you could be eating a lot of spaghetti and crackers and donuts and all these things and it would still be a plant-based diet but not, not whole enough to give you what you need. Here's a chart of magnesium showing you that, once again, spinach wins the prize, and that magnesium also is found in peanut butter and sunflower seeds and a, a lot of whole grains. And you notice the top two bars, the top bar is, is whole grain, and the one just below it is white flour. And you can see just how deficient it is. This is a bit technical, but I just had to show it to you. This is the adenosine triphosphate, the ATP that is the energy battery of our cell. Magnesium is what stabilizes these phosphate molecules on the edge there of the ATP. So we do also need magnesium for that. So that's another way that it's tied in with energy production. Now let's look a little bit about minerals and energy production. White flour losses, selenium, 52%, copper, 62%, potassium, 74%. It is pretty fair to say that white flour is stripped of its nutrients. Mm. And to say that it is enriched flour, I think, is a misnomer, to say the least. Ah, yes. Now, we talked about how energy is made in the cell. Okay, in the mitochondria of the cell, all of these things I've been talking about that pump up ATP go on, but they're all controlled. They're controlled by the thyroid hormones, and they control our metabolism. They rev it up to give us more energy, and they slow it down to give us less energy. But thyroid hormones are made with iodine, and they cannot be made without selenium. There's two forms, T3 and T4, and you simply can't convert your thyroid hormones to the active form without selenium. Brazil nuts, sesame seeds are two great sources of selenium, by the way. Iron, sulfur, and copper are all also needed in order to make energy. That electron transport chain that I showed you pictures of, you need iron, sulfur, and copper. They're all critical components to make energy. And these also are a little bit hard to find in processed foods in general. And nickel is real interesting. Now, nickel is used in anaerobic production. That's the other route that we can make a little bit of energy from sugar without oxygen but not without nickel, another trace mineral that is in short supply in white flour. Speaking of white flour and sugar, naturally leads me to think about diabetes. Diabetes is a huge problem in America now. It's at vast and epidemic proportions. And the number of Americans, including children, who are pre-diabetic is very, very large. I believe it's about 60 million Americans that are either diabetic or close to being diabetic at this time. Now, there's one mineral that's extremely important in your sugar metabolism, and this mineral is very hard to get, and it's chromium. 
And one form of chromium, trivalent chromium, is the one that does this, and it's a little bit hard to get in food, and it is stripped out of processed foods. So, gee, let me think. You got processed foods, and they're high in sugar, and they're high in carbohydrates that are stripped of all of these other nutrients. They're also stripped of chromium, and chromium is essential to get those carbohydrates into the cell and out of the bloodstream. And people wonder why they get diabetes eating processed foods. Well, this is, this is what I'm describing to you a little bit. It's like a cartoon. And if you look at number one, you'll see that the, the glucose is on the outside of the cell and the insulin is floating around in the bloodstream. And in number two, we have insulin has now locked onto the insulin receptor of the cell and the glucose is starting to enter the cell. Now off to the right are some chromium, trivalent chromium, just waiting to come into the cell. Now once the insulin has locked onto its base, then the chromium can come into the cell and the chromium activates the insulin and you'll see a much larger arrow on glucose. So that what happens is you can get a trickle of glucose into the cells without chromium, but you can get a lot more in with chromium. By the way, one of my sources of chromium that is important is nutritional yeast. Nutritional yeast is also a very nice source of all of your B vitamins, including B12, which is not found in normal brewer's yeast, but is found in fortified nutritional yeast. So I would highly recommend as a supplementary food nutritional yeast because it, it will provide you with this trivalent form of chromium along with lots of B vitamins. It's uh, not bad tasting and can be added. Generally speaking, it's best not to cook it because several of the B vitamins are sensitive to heat. Now I want to move to strong bones. Another of the challenges of an aging population of America is to keep bones strong. Now osteoporosis, it affects 25 million people and most of them are women. They're six times more likely than men to have bones that are are fragile and porous. And you can see in the picture below that when the bones are less dense, that's called osteoporosis. Porous means more open, not as dense. And when they're more dense, they're stronger. Although there's more to it than simple density. Now, what have we been taught all our lives? Drink your milk and you won't have strong bones, right? The Dairy Council has been hammering this into us since before we were born, literally. But it's not really true. Because if we look at osteoporosis around the world, in the countries with higher dairy consumption, we find that we get more osteoporosis. And in countries with very limited calcium intake, we find they have much less osteoporosis. Now osteoporosis is very, very important because when an older person has a fall and breaks a hip, that often can mean pretty much the end of their life. All of a sudden, they no longer can take care of themselves. They might not be able to walk or drive. It's something to be avoided, at, if at all possible. There are many good ways to avoid it, such as maybe taking yoga or tai chi so that your balance is better so you don't fall. Well, that's all very good and well, but let's talk tonight about strong bones, how to make them stronger. Now, there's one nutrient that can make your bones weaker, and that's vitamin A, but not the beta-carotene form, the form found in animal products and in milk. This form of vitamin A actually can contribute to the risk of osteoporosis and, and birth defects too. So you need to keep it very low or even zero, your intake of vitamin A from animal products. It's called preformed vitamin A, that's what it's termed. Now vitamin D is also critical. I have a little diagram here on how vitamin D works. When the sun shines on your skin, you get the exact same thing if you take vitamin D pills. It, it's really quite similar. Both forms go to the liver and are stored as calcidiol. Now, sorry about the names, but calcidiol is completely different than calcitriol, which is the active form of the hormone. So I apologize for the way that these terms are made, but if I said it was the 125-dihydrocholocalciferol form, that wouldn't even be better anyway. So we'll stick to calcidiol and calcitriol. It's the two forms. It's interesting because the calcidiol, the storage form and the circulating form of vitamin D, does nothing at all. It's only when the parathyroid hormone tells the calcidiol to go to the kidneys and instructs the kidneys to make the active form that you are really going to get the active form of vitamin D. And that active form of vitamin D, the basic thing it does is enrich your blood with calcium. That's what it does. It's 
one of its really important things. So when your blood calcium starts getting low, calcium is extremely vital to have exactly the right amount in your blood. There's this delicate balance between calcium and magnesium. If you want to contract muscles, you must use calcium. The calcium channels in the cell wall open, calcium goes in and the muscles contract. Magnesium is the one that allows your muscles to relax. So people who are experiencing low magnesium levels are very, very commonly can get spasms. So when your body looks at the blood and it sees that your calcium levels are low, it triggers the change from calcidiol to calcitriol, the active form of vitamin D. Now this does three things. First of all, it increases the absorption of calcium from the intestines into the blood. And secondly, it triggers the kidneys to reabsorb more calcium. So make them more efficient, so we absorb more calcium. That gets more calcium in the blood. But third, if that's not enough, then this active form of vitamin D will trigger the bones to release calcium into the bloodstream, causing osteoporosis. So that's very interesting. Now, this active form of vitamin D does something else. The other thing it does is prevent cancer. And it, it does this in, I won't go into the details, but this is enough said, prevents cancer. Very important prevention. Now what happens if you drink milk every day of your life and your, vitamin, your calcium levels are just top? What happens is that calcitriol is not secreted into your bloodstream and so your protection against cancer is much lower. So by having constantly high levels of calcium, you're actually contributing to your risk of cancer. And so this is one reason why dairy products are not such a good idea. And I have some other reasons I'll get into too. First, I want to show you about vitamin K. And vitamin K, now when we think about strong bones, nobody mentions vitamin K. But vitamin K is extremely important in fixing calcium in the bones. And vitamin K is found where? Vegetables. Spinach. Popeye was right again. And magnesium. Now this is very interesting. If your magnesium levels are low, your, your bone crystals tend to be larger and more brittle. So even if you have a bone density scan and it's showing that your bones are pretty dense, they might be larger, more brittle bones. So bone density scans are not the latest and only word. Uh, good weight-bearing exercise is, of course, very important to strong bones, really an important part of that. So let's see, I think I've covered most of this one. Ah, here's the good part. Excess salt. Now, Americans are supposed to get uh, about three and a half or less grams of sodium a day, and they average more like 10 grams a day, which is too much. Now, what happens if you take too much sodium is that because of the way the kidneys work, you start dumping calcium in, in order to keep your balances correct. So I worked it out. The average amount of sodium that the average woman gets in a day is enough to require an extra 287 milligrams of extra dietary calcium. Now what happens if she takes her average too much sodium and doesn't take that calcium? Osteoporosis. The calcium must come from somewhere. The blood will never change its calcium content. The bones function as a reservoir, and you will always find that the blood calcium is the same, no matter how hard the bones need to be hit for calcium. I think it's very interesting that excess salt is one of the critical components of osteoporosis, and it's very little known. I have not seen this. I've been to many talks on osteoporosis, and no one has said, lower your salt intake and your bones will be stronger. There's another one, excess protein. Now this is making this little skeleton guy think about it. Can excess protein somehow contribute to osteoporosis? Okay, well on the average, American women take in 24 extra grams of protein a day. For an adult woman, the RDA for protein is about 46 grams, but on the average, most women get, they say, 24 extra grams a day. In, I, I have this program called the Diet Doctor that I developed to analyze diets. And the way it works is you pick out what you ate in a day and tell the program how much, and it charts what you got and didn't get and how much you received of calcium from your diet and how much protein. And the average meat eater 
gets more like 150 to 200 grams a day. In other words, 150 grams more than they need, rather than just 25. But they say this is the national average. But even at this conservative figure, the extra protein calls for an extra 140 milligrams of calcium a day. So between the excess salt and the excess protein that the average woman eats, she needs an extra about 500 milligrams of calcium a day, more than she would. If she doesn't get it, it's going to come out of her bones. How does it work? Well, when you burn protein for energy, there are many acidic residues that occur in the metabolism in the cell. And these acidic residues, when they start to go into the bloodstream, must be buffered to a, a neutral pH. The blood has to be maintained at this neutral pH. And so blood buffers are used to do that. Well, one of the commonest blood buffers is calcium and also phosphorus. And calcium and phosphorus are both very much used in bones, by the way. They're both needed. So we neutralize the acids and we can lose it. Now. Here's an interesting point. If a high-protein diet where someone gets 130 grams a day, and this isn't even getting to Atkins. This is just kind of your average daily diet. And I've seen many people who eat pretty average American food get 130 grams extra. They need 750 milligrams extra. Now, this is a, definitely a very strong contributor to osteoporosis. So I look at excess salt and excess protein as both causes of osteoporosis. And they're very preventable. They're completely under your control. You can adjust it. Now, if you eat a whole plant-based diet, you will not get much excess protein. I tend to eat a lot. I tend to work a lot. And my average protein intake is 83 grams a day, a bit in excess of the 56 grams that they say I should take. Now, because my protein is derived from a lot of complex plant foods, I'm not getting every bit of it out of those complex foods. So 83 grams is maybe not quite over the top. Luckily, my salt levels, I try and keep low. Well, let's take a look now. We'll switch over to pregnancy and take a look at what pregnant, need, pregnant women need. I, I think most people have heard of neural tube defects. It's a terrible neurological problem. You must get folic acid, and it's interesting that you need it one month before conception. So it's already too late when you know you're pregnant to start your folic acid. And for this reason, the government has seen fit to fortify food with folic acid. It's probably not working completely, but it is helpful. Folic acid, as I mentioned, is found in green leafy vegetables. That's the great way to get it. Calcium. Now, see, calcium is a problem when you're pregnant because you not only have the normal needs of calcium, but you need to build the baby's bones. And one thing that you don't want to do is throughout the course of the life of a mother, not only calcium is put into the bone. Calcium is, is CA++, and so is lead, PB++. And a lot of times lead is substituted in the bones for calcium. So in most adult women, there is a certain amount of body burden of lead in the bones. My point is that if you force a calcium withdrawal from the bones during pregnancy, you're very likely to get lead out of the bones as well, and this can cause very bad problems for the growing baby. Iron deficiency is the, the commonest deficiency in the world. It's very common in pregnant women. Even the best diet, I don't care what it is, cannot provide enough iron for a woman in the last trimester, the final three months of pregnancy. So the body stores of iron are used during this time. It takes a tremendous amount of iron during this time to finish building the baby. So normally doctors do prescribe about 60 milligrams of iron during this time, and this should also be combined with zinc. And zinc's also needed, especially if you're taking a lot of iron. Iodine, as I mentioned, if it's very low, it can form a, a child with cretinism. And if it's just a little bit low, it's found to lower the IQ of the developing baby. Now, no one wants a baby with less IQ than they could possibly have. So a great form of iodine is seaweed. And seaweed's very traditional in Japanese food. It's delicious. One that I can recommend is wakame, although all of the forms of seaweed are delicious. Just be advised that seaweed's very high in sodium. So substitute seaweed instead of adding salt and seaweed. You can just add seaweed and you'll get plenty. By the way, I, I must mention that if you look at the consumption of salt in the American diet, you might think that it's that hand on the table putting salt in the food. No, it's not. You might think it's mom in the kitchen adding salt to the recipes. No. 
In the kitchen is about 10% of the sodium added and at the table about 10%. 80% is hidden in foods. Foods like crackers, breads, things that aren't salty at all have a high content of sodium. Processed foods contain a lot of sodium and you would never know they're there unless you read the label. Now we just have a few more slides. I know it's been a complex show for you here, but I wanted to talk a little bit about vitamin E. Vitamin E is very controversial. One study will show that vitamin E prevents heart attacks and strokes. The next study will show that it doesn't at all. And even one study showed that vitamin E was worse for heart attacks and strokes. So what's going on here? Here's a couple of studies that really seem to show that vitamin E is the greatest thing. The Cambridge study was huge and they found that supplemental vitamin E really helped prevent heart attacks. We all have heard about cholesterol and most of us know that there's LDL and HDL cholesterol. So fats and proteins are packaged together by the liver and they're shipped out to the body to make well vitamin D for one thing, to make the cell membranes for another. Cholesterol is very useful in the body and our bodies go to great lengths to make it and package it up into LDL. Now LDL is really only the good form of cholesterol if you have vitamin E in your body. If you have vitamin E in your body then you're able to package this cholesterol with the antioxidant. Vitamin E is the fat antioxidant. It's the one that protects our fats. And the two critical areas is the LDL cholesterol and also our cell membranes. Those are the areas where vitamin E is really essential. DL alpha tocopherol, that's the natural form. Or D alpha tocopherol, that's a synthetic form. The synthetic form is very interesting. It has eight isomers, eight different, well these are two isomers here. The synthetic form has one form is the top form and seven other parts of it are different isomers that are never found in nature, four of which have no vitamin E activity at all. Now, what happens when your liver incorporates a type of vitamin E that has no antioxidant activity into an LDL? Well, then that LDL can become oxidized and contribute to heart disease. So this is one reason why the studies are so inconsistent, is that almost all medical studies are done with what's called all RAC, alpha tocopherol. Uh, racemic means that it's a mixture of all of the different isomers of vitamin E, and it's not the natural vitamin E at all. And so the studies I've looked at that use the natural form of vitamin E do much better with preventing heart attacks in a supplemental form. And of course, the vitamin E in food is always the natural form. This is a picture of a cell membrane. It took quite a while drawing this one. And you'll see the phospholipids there. They have a, a head and a, a little tail. And in between the phospholipids are, are little spheres stuck together uh, that are supposed to represent cholesterol. And you see how important cholesterol is in every single cell membrane, it's vitally important. You can see where vitamin E fits in there. Vitamin E has this tail that sticks into the fatty inside of the cell membrane and it's capable of grabbing the free radicals there, bringing them up to the head and neutralizing them. It's a, it's a phenomenal process that our bodies have evolved to protect our cell membranes. And this also helps protect us, as you know, from not only heart disease but cancer because when free radicals get rampant, they damage our DNA. Um, so I, I think this is kind of a fun picture showing parts of the cell membrane. Vitamin E food sources, once again, sunflower seeds win. So I guess we could, from tonight's talk we could talk about the spinach and sunflower diet. I wonder if you could live on that. Probably you could. Pretty rich in nutrients. But again we see that nuts and seeds and vegetables are a great source of nutrients like vitamin E. Now vitamin B12 is almost always questioned because we want to know why on a vegan diet you don't get much vitamin B12. Well, what I've been finding is that even people on a meat diet or a dairy diet, they don't get much vitamin B12 either. Vitamin B12 is a tough one to get in. First of all, it's only made by bacteria. It's not made by any animals. And it's not made by any plants either. And the amount found in plants is minuscule, to say the least, uh, nanograms. When vitamin B12 is found in foods, it's attached to a protein. And when you digest it, it goes in your stomach and the protein is split off with the protein-digesting enzymes in the stomach. Then 
we make intrinsic factor, which has to be used in order for the vitamin B12 to attach to the wall of the intestines and be absorbed. Without intrinsic factor, it won't be. Now, intrinsic factor is a big problem. Most vitamin B deficiency is a problem with intrinsic factor and a problem with absorption and not a problem with the amount that we take in. Once it's taken in, it has a special binding protein. It's circulated through the blood. Now, we do make vitamin B12 in our lower intestines. If they're healthy lower intestines, the bacteria produce B12. There is an active transport mechanism that the vitamin B12 can be transported from the lower intestines into our bloodstream. What is uncertain is if that is enough in order for us to not get the severe neurological problems that can accompany vitamin B12 deficiency, or also anemia can be caused by vitamin B12 deficiency. My feeling is that either through fortified yeast or through some sort of supplementation, we probably all need a little bit extra vitamin B12 that's easy to absorb. Uh, a real interesting thing I learned is that the vitamin B12, when it's exposed to microwave cooking, is inactivated. Thanks to our resident chemistry professor, Carl Seff, I found out that it is the hydrogen bonds in B12 that are broken so that it can no longer perform its vitamin B12 function. Now, vitamin B12 is recirculated through the body for years and years. It's used over and over again. And in fact, the deficiency normally takes many years to, to show up if, in fact, one ever shows up. And that's because when the B12, which is used uh, a lot to make new blood cells, once it's used up, it's returned to the liver where it's put into the bile, returned to the intestines where it's reabsorbed, and then so on and so forth in a continuous loop so that we tend not to lose it at all, and it's preserved. So this preservation is very good, and coupled with a good digestion, some populations have managed to not be vitamin B12 deficient, even though they seem to get almost none from their diet. Nevertheless, I would recommend that we all get some supplemental vitamin B12, regardless of, of what diet you have. You've been a very patient audience. I'm going to reward you with this picture of our sailboat sojourn at anchor in the Sea of Cortez. Thank you so much. Well, uh, you can talk to me afterwards. Thank you, Paul. Very nice. No, you have to shut me up. <laughs> well, uh, I have just a few things to say. Uh, first of all, you've just heard an excellent lecture in nutritional biochemistry. With, and if you've survived it, if you've understood a good part of it, hooray for you. There will be a quiz. <laughs> uh, chairs to the back of the room, please, if you can manage it. And we have refreshments from down to earth in the kitchen. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Hello. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.